All right. I do believe I am live on Facebook. PDT T here, y'all. Um, going to start right at 2.30. It's a beautiful day in Chicago. If you haven't been outside and you're in Chi-Town, I highly recommend that you go outside today because it is gorgeous. Um, seeing that light might make it hard to see me. I'm trying to make sure I can be seen. Okay. All right, good. Uh, here's my sister. Hello, sister. Okay, uh, going to give people a, a few minutes to come on. And we're going to do like we always do. And that is go before the Lord and hear what the Holy Ghost is saying. And what that means to us today. You've heard me tell my story several times, but when I was younger, many times I heard a bunch of things growing up that I just did not understand. And sometimes I would ask questions and some of the adults around me would say, well, David, you asked too many questions. And when I hear people saying things about what God's going to do and all this different kind of stuff, then it's like, what am I supposed to do? What is my part in that? What, you know, what, what, uh, what part do I play? And so I always promised myself, I made an internal promise that if I ever got called into ministry, I was going to make a point of giving some practical application that whatever it was I was teaching or prophesying about or whatever revelation the Lord gave, that it needs to fit into your life. It needs to fit in right now. It needs to be something you can take and learn from and use right now in your life. Okay. All right. It's 2.30. So we're going to start. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to come before you. Thank you, oh God, for the mind to serve you, oh God, because that comes from you. Thank you, God, for your revelations and for your precious word and for the precious Holy Ghost, the third person of the eternal Godhead that lives with us and indwells us and guides us in all truth. Lord, I must decrease so you can increase. So I, I, I crucify myself right now, Lord. I put my, my flesh and myself on the cross, not my will, but thine be done. I ask you to speak through me, O oh God. I ask you to breathe through me. I ask you to let me said what you once said, that you might be glorified in all things, that your truth might come forth unfettered and unhindered, and that the people that hear it might hear it and believe it and obey it and be edified and become more of what you want us to be, and that the demons might be terrified, and that unbelievers would be challenged to turn from their way of thinking and turn to you, because truly we need you, because there is no solving problems apart from you. So we thank you for it, and I declare and decree that all that hear and believe and obey this word, signs and wonders and miracles shall follow. And the Spirit of God himself will give testimony to the accuracy of the prophetic and preached and taught word of God. We thank you for it, and I believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. Okay, today's weekly live prophetic word is, hear what the Spirit says to the church. Okay. Hear what the spirit says to the church. That's our weekly live prophetic word for today. So I'm going to take you to our scriptures and we're going to jump right in. First scripture we're going to look at is Revelation chapter one, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible. It's the last book of the New Testament, but it's also the last book of the Bible. Okay, we're going to start at Revelation chapter 1. We're going to read verse 9 through 20. Okay. Now, the person that wrote the book of Revelation is Apostle John. Apostle John is the one that laid his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. So he and Jesus were really, really close. Apostle John is the one that when Jesus was dying, he gave his mother Mary to John. And he gave John to Mary because Jesus was the eldest son and he was going away. So he wanted to be sure that Mary was taken care of and that she he, uh, she had an elder son because the Lord was no longer go going to be around. So the apostle John wrote the gospel of John. He wrote first, second and third John and he wrote the book of Revelation. OK, so that's the author. That's who we're talking about today. John was around 90 years old which is what most scholars say that John was in his ninth decade. He was around 90 years of age when he wrote the book of Revelation. So right there, there's a lesson 
to never count yourself out for God using you to make a difference regardless of age. Because if you're 90 and God shows you the end of the world in detail, we still read John's words every day. John's words in the book of Revelation are still impacting us now. So, so just to give you a little bit of background, okay? Revelation chapter one, verses nine through 20, and I'm reading out of the New International Version. Here we go. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I, fe <clears throat> I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. <clears throat> in English, that says death and hell in other translations. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay, lots to unpack there. I'll just go over some stuff briefly, briefly because I could spend all day there. Okay. Uh, John was exiled on the island of Patmos. That's what he means when he says he was there because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus because God, John would not compromise the fact that he knew Jesus personally and he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He was in exile. They didn't kill him like they did the other apostles because the Lord told him when he was a young man uh, that he might end up living longer than the rest of them, but they misunderstood what the Lord said, but that's another thing. But anyway, John did end up outliving all the other apostles, okay? On the Lord's day, he was in the spirit. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. I want you to notice that when the Lord showed up, he was behind John and he did not ask him a question and he did not make a request. He gave a command. He said, write on a scroll. He did not say, what do you think about this, John? He said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea were the cities where the churches were located. John turned around and then John got a vision of the Lord. Now I want you to understand something. When the Lord was incarnated the first time when he came through Mary's womb and wrapped himself in human flesh and he became a human like we are, there is no physical description of Jesus during that time, except when he's on the cross. They describe the uh, hairs of his beard being plucked out. Uh, they describe the Lord beating, beat, uh, being beat up so badly, you would not recognize him even as a human. You wouldn't have looked at Jesus on the cross and said, who is that? You would have said, what is that? Because they beat the Lord up very, very badly, okay? Uh, and then it talks about the spear in his side. And that's the only physical description we have of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So when, when the Lord became a man the first time, it was so unimportant how he looked that not one of the Bible writers of his life described him. How tall was the Lord when he was a man? Was he 5'9"? Was he 6'2"? What kind of singing voice did he have? Did he have a rich baritone? Did he have a strong high tenor? Okay. Were his hands weathered? Were his fingers long and thin? Were they short and stunned? Okay. What color were his eyes? Yeah, see, that's nowhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. The Lord is never described physically. So we pretty much uh, understand that he looked like the rabbis of his day because he had to be pointed out. He did not stand out physically. So the lesson there is that it's not what you look like, it's who you are, okay? But here in the book of Revelation, 
we get a physical description of Jesus. Now, the reason this is so important is because there's very few churches you see this in. And that's one of the things that has messed up Christianity to this day. Yes, I said it. The iconography or the, the storytelling in pictures, the art of Christianity has messed people up. It has messed Christians up. Do you know why? Because I can almost guarantee of a surety if you grew up in America, the majority of pictures that you have seen of the Christ have been on him on the cross. You've seen Jesus on literally the worst day and the worst hour of his life, where he was beat up, where he had been whipped, where he had a crown of thorns on his head, and where he was dying for our sins, where he became sin on the cross, and he was stretched out with nails in his hands and nails in his feet, uh, a nail each in his hand, one nail through both of his feet, and then he was pierced in the side, and the blood and the water came out. You saw, if you saw a picture of Jesus, I can almost guarantee that's the picture of Jesus you saw, or you've seen more pictures of Christ on the cross than anything else. And that would have messed us up. You know why? Because you couldn't go back when we had church, you couldn't go in the average church and see a picture of what Jesus looks like now. That's why in particular, so many men tend to struggle in their walk with God because they kept getting presented an image of a crucified savior. And that's when the Lord surrendered to the will of God, because remember, he didn't want to do that. And where the Lord took the punishment that our sins deserve from Adam's sin, the original sin, to all the sins that mankind has committed. He was taking the punishment, that beating was beating that we deserved. That brutal death on the cross was actually what we deserve. But the Lord said, I'll take it for them. And so a whole lot of men now have this wrong idea that the Lord is somehow some type of broken you know, limp wristed, you know, maybe hippie, you know, whatever, that he's somehow less than a man and none of that is true. But you've seen him most often, even people that wear a crucifix, there's nothing wrong with a crucifix, I have a cross on right now. It's not a crucifix, what's the difference? Crucifix is when Jesus' body is still on the cross and the cross symbolizes the cross itself. Nothing wrong with a cross, nothing wrong with a crucifix, but my point is that that iconography has messed up your thinking. Because who has a picture of what Jesus looks like now? The Lord was resurrected from the grave on the third day, like Father promised him. And then the Lord ascended and got re-glorified and he became fully God again. So he is now fully God and fully man. And what he looks like now, he is among seven golden lampstands and when John says he was someone like a son of man, that means it looked like a human. He had a, a humanoid form, head, eyes, you know, hands, lips, uh, feet, stuff like that. He had a golden, uh, he had. A, he was dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet. So he had an uh, ankle length robe, a golden sash around his chest. His hair was white like wool, white like snow, and his eyes were blazing like fire. His very feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. So they were like heated metal. And his voice was as a sound of rushing water. So when John said he first heard him, he said his voice sounded like a trumpet. His voice also sounds like rushing water. So have you ever been around, you know, rapids? If you've ever been around anything where you go kayaking or waterfalls, John said his voice sounded like that. In his right hand, he held seven stars and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. So the Lord, or in his right hand, the Lord was holding the seven stars, and he tells us what that is. And then coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. So in other words, what John saw coming out of Jesus' mouth wasn't a tongue. What he saw coming out of his mouth was a sword, and it was sharp, and it was double-edged. Not a single edge, but a double edge. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. So we had a glow about him. So just like it's a beautiful sunlit day, John is saying that's what Jesus' face looked like, like the sun on a brilliant day. That's what the Lord looks like now. Let me challenge you. How many pictures have you ever seen of Jesus where he looks like that? So that right there is why your image and your, your concept of God is all wrong. You don't see the reward. And this is significant for what we're gonna talk about today. That's why I'm taking time with it. You don't see the reward that Father gave Jesus. Father gave Jesus not only the re-glorification of becoming God again, but he gave him a throne, he gave him a scepter, 
He gave him a rod of iron to rule the nations. He gave him the name above every name. He told him to sit down until his enemies be made his footstool. That means that what Father God is doing ever since the Lord resurrected and ascended is being sure that everything bows to Jesus and the Lord can sit down. So that's significant. That's significant. And so that's why a lot of men in particular, but people in general, don't want to follow the Lord because, because we haven't focused on the reward. We focused on the suffering and we focused focused on the heinousness of how the Lord looked on the cross and we focused on the brokenness and we focused on the guilt and the shame. We focused on everything that took him to the cross. We focused on what he experienced on the cross. We focused on what he looked like on the cross, but almost nobody focuses on the reward. And ever since I was little, but especially since I became an adult, that just blows my mind with how wrong that is. All you want to do is focus on the worst day of his life. All you want to do is focus on focus on the uh, worst time of his life, but you never focus on the reward. And that's why people think that being a Christian means being a loser, being a loser. And that is incorrect because the Lord is the ultimate winner. He followed Father God's will to the T. And in return for his being obedient unto death, he got all this stuff that only Father God could give him. And what he looks like now is not, he's in the same body, but that body got re-glorified. It got transformed into something that is both God and man because he still has the nail prints in his hands and in his feet. It's the same body, but it, it, it got re-endowed, re-ignited, re-infused, recharged with divinity. So again, ankle length robe, golden sash, seven golden lampstands, hair on his head, white like wool, white as snow, uh, eyes blazing like fire, feet glowing like hot metal, like hot bronze, voice like uh, Niagara Falls, rushing waters, rapids, seven stars in his hand, instead of a tongue, a sharp double-edged sword, and the glow of his face is like the sun shining in all its bright, as bright as the sun can be. That's what the Lord's face looked like. Now, can you see that alone changes the whole game? Is that how you think of Jesus when you pray? When you talk to the Lord, do you think of him like that? Or do you think of how he looked like when he was in human form <coughs> before he went to the cross? Because that's what he looks like now. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand, right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I'm alive forever and ever. Amen. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Verse 19, write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the Lord says right there for what you have seen, what it is now and what will take place later. Past is what you have seen. What is now is present and what will take place later. So the Lord is talking to John from all three time periods. He's talking to John from past, present and future. Why is that significant? I'll tell you why that's significant. Because anything that God says, it happens as soon as he said it. Anything that God says is true and it happens as soon as it comes out of his mouth. I know that sounds confusing, but you have to get out of linear thinking. You think, we think as humans that a 24 hour cycle, that a trip around the sun in a year is <clears throat> how it's the nature of reality is how life works. The nature of reality is not two 12 hour cycles. It's not 365 days, 366 on leap year. The nature of reality is whatever God says. Whatever God says, it happens as soon as he says it. But some things that God says unfold in time. Okay, so let me challenge you with this. What was it that the Lord showed John? He did not show John a movie. What the Lord showed John in all this revelation was the end of the world and it's already happened. I know that hurts your brain. You cannot figure that out with linear thinking. The end of the world has already happened. What was John looking at? Was he looking at a film? Was he looking at a movie? What was John looking at then? He was looking at the actual end of the world because it's already happened. When the word of God comes forth out of God's mouth, it happens as soon as he says it. But some words unfold in time some words it takes hundreds 
maybe thousands of years to fully unfold. Okay, but it couldn't unfold if there's nothing there to unfold. I know the Holy Spirit's got to give you revelation on what I'm saying, because I know that sounds confusing on the surface, but ask the Spirit of God to help you understand that, because it is not linear and based in time. It's outside of time. So then the Lord goes on to say the mystery of the seven stars. So remember, everything that the Lord says happens, and he's saying that some of this stuff is going to take place later. He means later from our point of view. He means later on after many days have passed. Not it hasn't happened yet. It's going to unfold on the earth as the days unfold. Okay, but it already happened as soon as he said it. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now that word there, angels, is coming from um, a Greek word, uh, angelos. You know, uh, you could pronounce it agalos or angelos. It means a messenger from God, but the context is what determines whether or not it means an actual angel or a human messenger. It can mean a human messenger. In Matthew eleven ten, 10, uh, when the Lord is talking about John the Baptist, uh, this is the one about whom it is written, behold, I will send my messenger ahead of you. That word there, messenger, is agalos or angelos or angion. So in other words, when we see that word angion or agalos, it can mean uh, a human messenger or it can mean a angelic messenger, depending on the context in which it's said. So what a lot of people believe when the Lord says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, they, they think the Lord is referring to the pastors of these churches. Or it could be an apostle because apostle means messenger, apostle means sent one. So a lot of people interpret what the Lord means there is he's talking about the human leaders of the churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, why is that important? Why is that significant? I'll tell you why it's significant. Don't miss what I'm about to say. It's important because the Lord just told you that he walks among the church. He walks among us. He's um, in the midst of the seven lampstands, those other churches. And he has the messengers, the apostles, the pastors, or if he's talking about actual angels, in his hand. That means if you're part of the body of Christ, that the Lord is walking among us all the time. Did you know that? Did you know that if you're a Christian, no matter what kind of denomination or body you're a part of, that the Lord is walking among you all the time? Did you know that? And <clears throat> the Lord does that to give us our grades. I'll get into that in a minute. What's the significance of the number seven? The number seven always represents a number of completeness, uh, excuse me, completeness and a perfect number, a number that encompasses the full testimony of that thing. So that's why the Bible refers to as the Holy Ghost as the seven spirits of God. It means the completeness of God, the completeness of whatever anointing you need will be found in the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible has a whole numerical system. One is the number of uh, solitary, uh, the self-sustaining one. One always refers to God, the one who doesn't need anything else. Two is the number of witness, Three is the number of perfect witness. Four is the number of foundation. Four corners of the earth, four winds of the earth. Five is the number of grace, the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Four fingers and a thumb, the hand of God. Six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. Then you have seven. Eight is the number of new beginning. Nine is the number of fruitfulness, on and on and on. Okay, there's a numerical system. It's a really deep study. And there's some people that have spent years breaking down the numbers of the Bible. But whenever you see numbers in the Bible, I'm bringing that up to let you know it's significant. And so what the Lord is trying to say by saying seven churches and seven stars, he's talking about, I'm talking to the complete church. I'm talking to the complete church, past, present, and future. So in other words, these prophetic words and these prophetic warnings are not just for the actual seven churches that were in Asia at that time. It's talking about the complete body of Christ across time. That means it's talking to you. Let me say that one more time. That means the Lord is talking to you. And when we get into this stuff, 
I'm about to get into, you see what I'm talking about. It's talking to you. And that's why so many people get the Christianity confused because the things in the Bible are not just for the people that were experiencing them. The things in the Bible are talking to us right now. Okay. So the Lord is in our midst all the time. Now let me go on now. Let me explain to you Revelation chapter two and Revelation chapter three. Those two chapters are the Lord giving the grades to the pastor or to the apostle and to these churches. The Lord goes into detail as to what he sees. It's very important you understand that because you won't understand what happened in 2020 unless you understand that. That the Lord is in the midst of the churches, the lampstands, and that what he's doing now, what Jesus is doing now, we spent so much time talking about his earthly ministry, and we should. We spent so much time talking about his time on the cross, and we should. But we certainly spend more time on Christmas, Christmas than we do on Easter. We sure do spend more time on his birth than we do on his death and resurrection. But what is he doing now? He's walking among the churches, the seven lampstands, all of us, the body of Christ worldwide, past, present, and future. And he's giving out grades. He's letting us know in detail, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. This is what you need to keep doing. This is what you need to stop doing. And then he says something very significant, which is our prophetic word for today. Let's look at Revelation 2 and 7. He says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. And then he says to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So I need to read all seven verses for you so you understand Revelation 2, 1 through 7. Here we go. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. There it is. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how, how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Do you understand what I just read to you? The Lord says, right in that first verse, I walk among you. Then he says, I know your deeds. I know your hard work, your perseverance. The Lord says, I see what you're doing. I know your hard work. I know how you're hanging in there. I know you can't tolerate wicked people. You've tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. Because yes, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, we can be tested. I've told you several times what my test is as a prophet. My test as a prophet is, if what I say doesn't come to pass, and you have to listen to nothing I say. God said, if someone calls themselves a prophet and they prophesy in the name of the Lord, but what they say does not come to pass, the prophet has spoken presumptuously. It is not from the Lord, and you don't have to listen to it, and you don't have to be afraid of it. That's in Deuteronomy. That's my test. Every fivefold ministry office has a test, if you didn't know that. A way to test to see if they're who they say they are. And the Lord said, you tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Uh, I want to give you that exact scripture. Sorry, my laptop is uh, moving as I type. I want to give you that exact scripture. It's Deuteronomy 18.22. Deuteronomy 18.22. Verse 21 says, you may ask in your heart, how can we recognize a message that the Lord has not spoken? Verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and the message does not come to pass or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. That is why I pray every time before I come out here. That's why I must die to myself so that the Holy Ghost can speak through me because I don't want to be speaking. Presumptually means that you're presuming to know the will of God. Did you know that you can't ever presume to know the will of God? You have to ask him. You have to ask him every day. 
That's why every day the Lord taught us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why would we have to say that every day? You cannot presume or assume that you know the will of God. You have to ask him every day, did you know that? So as a prophet, anyone walking in the prophetic, you can't assume that you know what the Lord is saying. You have to ask him. That's why the Holy Ghost is here. The Holy Ghost listens to Jesus. The Holy Ghost only says what Jesus is saying. That's why you have to invoke the Holy Ghost before you prophesy. That's why you see me pray. That's why you see me close my eyes and speak in tongues. I'm asking the Holy Ghost, what are you saying? Because I don't want to speak presumptuous, presumptuously because I'm just a man. I want him to speak because whatever he says is going to come to pass. Did you know that? So the Bible teaches you, you can test apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to see if we are who we say we are. Did you know that? And I just gave you the test of a, of a prophet, Deuteronomy 18, 22. Okay. But then the Lord said, back to Revelation chapter two, verses four, uh, the Lord said, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Uh, repent and do the things you did at first. The Lord is talking about, uh, in the King James, he's talking about thou have uh, left thy first love. What that means, the Lord is saying, you don't love me like you first did when you first got saved. The Lord said, I hold this against you. If you ever was at a point in your walk with, with Christ where you just love Jesus, you just love Jesus. Like when you first got saved, you just love the Lord. You couldn't get enough of him. You couldn't get enough of the word. You just love Jesus. You love to spend time in his presence, time of prayer. You just love the Lord. And you're not there now. Then the Lord is saying he holds that against you. The Lord wants you to love him the same way you loved him when you first got saved, when you first met him, the love you had at first. That is also why we want that in marriage, by the way. That's where that comes from. That's where we get it from. You want your partner to be just as excited about you now as y'all were when you first got together. And a whole lot of people say that, well, infatuation fares, wears off and this and this and that, but the Lord says, repent and do the things you did at first. Repent and do the things you did at first. What did you first do when you first got saved? You was in the word. You made time for prayer. You made time to go to the house of God. You made time for praise to thank the Lord for what he did for you. Okay, what did you do when you first fell in love? Man, you looked as good as you possibly could. Breath was fresh, teeth were shining, cologne on, perfume on, hair did, weave did. Okay, nice clothes. You spoke kind words. You laughed at, at their silly jokes and, and you just enjoyed each other's company. You can do that again. Did you know that? You keep trying to say, well, I don't feel, so I can't do. That's not the way it works. The Lord said, you can do. You can do, and then you'll feel. So if you want to fall back in love with the Lord, the thing to do is remember how it was when you first got saved. Because when we first got saved, we thank the Lord all the time just for being saved. That's not supposed to go away. And when you first got with your partner, remember all the stuff you did. Remember all the stuff you did. Remember all the stuff you did to get in their life. You can do it again. So the Lord is saying, repent. But then he says, verse five, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. I, I can't understand by the hair of my chinny chin chin why people just skip over what the Lord just said. The Lord said, if you don't fall back in love with Jesus like you were when you first loved him, he's going to come and take you out. He said, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Why do you think so many churches disappeared in 2020? I'm not making that up. Right there in the scripture, I just read it to you. Why do you think God took his mighty hand and wiped out so many denominational things? You know why? Because we was loving everything but Jesus. That's why. Hat parade, chicken dinner, building offering. Uh, then in the 90s, we entered into the age of the celebrity pastor. Then we started bragging on who our pastor was if he was on TV. Then we started, then we entered into the age of the mega church. Then we started talking about how big the congregation was. And then recently, especially since 2010, if not sooner, uh, I noticed we started talking about who the worship leader was. That's a big thing in Chicago. Those of y'all that's not from Chicago, that's a big deal in Chicago. People go to churches based on who the worship leader is. I kid you not, I'm not making that up. People would say, well, who's the worship leader? Oh, well, I go to this church because of this person. And because of that person, they go because of the worship leader. 
So in other words, we was loving everybody except Jesus. We was following everybody except Jesus. And then we started, we started bragging on each other, talking about how if you don't go to a mega church, you know, I go to a big name church and my ministry's on TV and, you know, all different kind of stuff. And nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. We're supposed to do that. We're supposed to reach as many people with the good news of the kingdom as we can. We're supposed to use technology. Nothing wrong with that. But that's not the point. If God gives you a worldwide reach, praise God and bless his holy name that he will lift your voice up for many people to hear it. But that's not the point. <laughs> the point is to teach people how to love the Lord. How do I know it is true? Because the Lord said, you have forsaken the love you had. Then he says, repent, do the things you did at first. And the Lord said, if you don't repent, the Lord said, if you don't want to love me like you used to, if you're in love with every, with every part of you in love, like, okay, there's like hood rats and there's like club rats and there's like mall rats. Did you know there was church rats? I'm not making it up because <laughs> I know some people like that. I'm not going to call no names. I know some people like that. They go from church to church to church just to see what's happening, just to stay up on the gossip, just to see who the worship leader is, just to see who's sleeping with who, just to see what kind of music they're doing so they can compare and run their mouth. And just like whoever the hot church is in Chicago, because Chicago was really, really big for that. The hot church, like what church is popping off right now, like who's doing the latest music or which church has the most celebrities come to it or stuff like that. That's a big deal in Chi-Town. And the Lord said, that don't mean nothing about nothing. The Lord said, you're supposed to be loving me. Okay. You're supposed to be loving me, says the Lord. You're supposed to be loving me. And the Lord says right there that if you don't, he said, I'm going to come and remove your lampstand from this place. Why do you think so many churches now are gone? I'm going to say that one more time. Why do you think so many churches now are gone? I'll tell you why they're gone. Because the Lord told us that we need to love him like when we first got saved. That, that serving Christ, being a Christian, is about loving him. Not about the size of the congregation. Not about whether or not you got a celebrity pastor. It's not about that. Okay? So then... But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. That was a, a sect during a John's time. And then he says this, and here's the prophetic word for today. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let me tell you what the Lord did not say. The Lord did not say, he that hath an ear, let him trip on the way. His pastor rolls his R's. If you say, <laughs> he that hath an ear, let him trip on the fact that, well, my pastor don't really wear a suit. Let him trip on the fact that, you know, my pastor got a big old chain on or not. Let him trip on who my pastor is married to and blah, 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 blah. All the stuff that we focus on is none of what the Lord said. The Lord said, you need to hear what the Holy Ghost is saying to the church. Why is that important? Because if you don't love the Lord like you used to, the Lord said at some point, he's going to come and take you out. No more church, which is what we have now. And a lot of people dying early, which is what we have now. How can you say the word of God is not relevant and it doesn't apply to today? You're living it. But here's the positive part. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the spirit says to the church, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, the Lord says that seven times. I'm going to read you each one. I'm not going to read all the messages to the church, but I am going to read how he ends each one of his report cards. He ends it with those words. He that hath an ear or to him that has ears, let him hear what the spirit, the Lord is like, listen to the Holy Ghost. Don't trip on whether or not your pastor has a beard. All the little things that we talk about, all the little things that we obsess on, all the little reasons we go to church, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, what is the Holy Ghost saying to the church? Okay, now I'm going to read you every time the Lord uses that phrase in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. So I just read you Revelation 2, 7. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 11. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Amen. I like that one. Revelation 2 and 17, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Revelation chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 26. The Lord kind of reverses the order here. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. The, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I told you, there it is. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Revelation chapter three. Verse five, the one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Revelation three and 12, the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I'll also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's one of my favorites. Revelation 3.21, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now here's what the Holy Ghost is saying to us today. What the Lord is saying to us today is this that the Lord has rewards for, I don't know, I saw a man look like my son. The Lord has rewards for those that stay faithful to him. The Lord has rewards for those that stay faithful to him. And for some of y'all, that reward time is now. Some of y'all need to start claiming your rewards from Christ. Because remember, I told you, whenever God says something, it's ha it happens as soon as he says it. It's true as soon as he says it. It's not going by and by to some pie in the sky when you die. It's right now. So what that means is that if you're favored to the Lord, you start claiming these rewards now. What does that look like? I'll show you. Uh, Revelation 3.21, to the one who's victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. You know what that means? God will put you in a position where you have a throne, a space carved out all for yours, and you're the head and not to tell, you're the one in charge. God will give you that now in this life. You don't have to wait until you die. He'll give you a throne now, okay? Did you know that? The one who's victorious, Revelation 3 and 12, the one who's victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. The Lord says that when you overcome, he's gonna make you a pillar in the temple. You will be one of the support beams that holds up the very temple of God. I was just talking uh, to my family about people like that today. The people that I grew up with that were the pillars of the church because that reward is for right now. Um, all y'all would know who I was talking about if I called their names, but people that, that we grew up in the same church, you know, we know exactly what I'm talking about. They were pillars in the temple. They were people that were there every Sunday. There were people that loved the Lord. There were people that taught us how to love the Lord, how to be filled with the Holy Ghost and how to serve him. They were pillars in God's temple. We could count on them. We could go to them for instruction. We could go to them to understand scripture. We could go to them for the filling of the Holy, Holy Ghost. We could go to them for prophetic words because they were pillars. That's now, that's not when you die. It goes to another level when you die. But God gives you that right now. So the point I'm trying to make in a prophetic word to some of y'all listening to me right now, to those of you watching me live, and those of you that are listening on the replay, God is trying to reward you now. You can begin to claim it if you are faith. See, that's why I started off by saying the picture we see of Jesus the most is him crucified. 
the uh, on the cross, this picture that we see of Jesus the least is him, like John described him, fully reglorified in his glory on his throne in his robe with his scepter with the sword coming out of his mouth. Okay, when's the last time you saw a picture of Christ like that? Because Christ is the picture of how God rewarded Jesus because Jesus served him faithfully until the end. And just like Father rewarded Jesus, I just read it to you. Jesus said, he'll reward you the same way, but that's right now. And some of y'all need to start claiming your reward. Why is that important? I'll tell you why that's important. Uh, matter of fact, let me look up the scripture so I can quote it properly to you. Okay, the scripture I'm talking about is Psalm 27 and 13. And it reads, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You know what that means? That means that it's so easy to get discouraged in this life. What you need to make it in this life is some reward. There's some rewards in serving the Lord and they're not all reserved for after you die. They go to a different level after you die but you get those rewards now. And some of y'all looking at me right now, the Holy Ghost wanted me to encourage you and to let you know that you are supposed to be rewarded in this life and that you can start claiming them. You can take these scriptures and pray them back to Father God, pray them back to Jesus and say, Lord, I've been serving you faithfully. I've been paying my tithes. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. I've been serving you faithfully and watch God reward you now in this life, okay? That is what the Spirit is saying to the church March 21, 2021, that those that serve the Lord faithfully, that's why you need to go back and read Revelation 2 and 3 so you can see all the rewards. And it's also so you know that before the Lord gets to those words, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church, he gives you a report card. So what that means is that when you go before the Lord, you need to be ready to get your grades. Some people live their whole lives, and they never do what I just said. Some people live their whole lives, their whole Christian lives, and they never get a report card from Christ. And they stand before the Lord, and they, they bring all these good works and all the stuff that they did because they thought that was right. And the Lord just shakes his head and said, to some people, get out of my face. I never knew you. We never had a relationship. Because the Lord told you in the first church that what he wants is a relationship. He wants you to love him like you did when you first got saved. But sometimes we get so busy and we get so caught up in serving the Lord, we forget to love the Lord and we forget to learn how to know the Lord. And then you're going to spend your life doing a whole bunch of religious things that's not going to amount to, as my late uncle used to say, a hill of beans. You are supposed to get your report card from the Lord now. So I suggest, you know, I do the prophetic locator word. That's once a year, but I suggest a minimum of once a quarter. I would not go longer than three months and get a report card from the Lord and ask the Lord, how am I doing? What am I doing? Am I doing what you want me to do? Because if you're not doing what God wants you to do, you're wasting your time on earth. And God is under no obligation to honor your program. So in other words, all the stuff that you make up that where you decide, I'm going to serve God this way. If it's not what he wants, he don't have to honor that. He don't have to honor that in this life or the life to come because he don't bow down before us. We bow down before him. Remember when I started, I told you, first thing the Lord says, write down what you see in the scroll. He didn't ask John. He gave a commandment. He said, you do this because he's the Lord. We bow down before him. He don't bow down before us. We follow him. He don't follow us. We obey him. He don't obey us. A lot of Christians nowadays got that backwards. They think that God is a genie and that you can make up any program you want and the Lord is just going to magically endorse your program. That's not how this works. That's not what the scripture says. He gives us loving authority and loving commandments, and we give him loving faith and loving obedience. That's the way it works. So before you get to the point of claiming your rewards, be sure that you get your report card from the Lord. I know that might seem scary, but it's necessary because it's in the scriptures. Anything in the scriptures is fair game. And anything in the scriptures, God is going to hold us accountable for. 
That's why we have a Bible, so we can know God's will and his thoughts. So get your grades from Jesus. Ask the Lord, are you pleased with how I'm living? Are you pleased with what I'm doing? Is there anything I need to change? Okay, what do I need to repent of? That kind of thing. And then when you start getting that stuff right, the Lord said, when you overcome, when you get victorious, the Lord said, I have these rewards for you. That's not just when you die, that's right now. And some of y'all, this Holy Ghost is telling me to tell you, start claiming your rewards from God. Because if you don't get rewarded in this life, you're going to faint. I just read it to you. Let me read it again, Psalm 27, 13. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In other words, God's going to bless me now, <laughs> right now in this life, not, not after I die. You understand? Okay. That's today's ladybug. I'm going to say that's today's live prophetic word. Okay. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen now. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen now. Okay. Now I'm going to ask y'all this again because y'all didn't do it last time. Now I, I told you that every that my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach. Okay? That's my goal. But I cannot increase my reach uh, by myself. I'm going to need help. And the help that I'm going to ask for, I told you that every time I did a video, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Now, I know y'all didn't do this last time because I didn't see my subscribers go up. So I'm going to ask you the same thing again. I want you to go to my music ministry, which is Shades of the Cross. That's the name. My prophetic music ministry. My prophetic music ministry is named Shades of the Cross. I'm trying to type it out. Okay. And I want you to go to my YouTube channel. I'm going to put the YouTube link in the chat. I want you to go to my YouTube channel and subscribe to the channel and watch the videos. I know y'all didn't do that last time because my subscriber count didn't change. I'm trying to increase my reach. So I'm asking you to do this one thing. Click on that link in the chat, the YouTube link. Go to my Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross YouTube channel. Subscribe to the channel watch some videos and like the videos that you watch i've got all kinds of music i've got workout music you can play music while you're working out if you don't want to work out the secular music i got gospel workout music i got rap videos i got contemporary gospel i got hymns i got a bunch of i got worship music i got piano music strings music where there's no words just quiet stuff for you to listen to and worship so go to my youtube channel subscribe and like and watch the videos that's the one thing i'm asking you to do in this video to help me increase my reach for 2021, okay? All right, God bless you, that's it. Uh, we are just a few days away from the end of March. Can you believe that? 2021, man, it, it's flying, it's flying. So I will be here at the same time next week, uh, March 28th, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for our next weekly live prophetic word. Thank you so much. Uh, let me put my Zelle up there. You wanna bless me financially? You can send it to personal email. Uh, if you want to make a donation to my ministry. Uh, also, I have a Patreon page that's uh, for my Shades of the Cross ministry. So if you want to become a patron, uh, the music that you get there goes to helping me make more music. I was actually mixing in the studio before I did my weekly live today because I'm working on this track and I'm getting down to the final mix and I'm super excited about it. So uh, definitely, I'll let you know when it drops, okay? So amen. So remember that it's time to claim your rewards from the Lord. Get your grace from the Lord first. Be sure that you're loving him and serving him the way he wants you to. And then start claiming your rewards right now. You don't have to wait till after you die. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, all right? Amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. And I will see you same time next week. God bless.